Our subject for this study today is entitled The Marriage of the Lamb. This program is going to be a little different from the programs that we have had up to this point. You see, I'm an old college lecturer. I taught Bible in four colleges, training young ministers, and we always have to give quizzes, tests, and exams. So I've prepared a quiz for you today. I have listed down eight last day events and I have arranged them on the screen, you see them, in an incorrect order. And I'd like to challenge you to see if you can arrange them in the correct order that they should be arranged. Perhaps we could take a, a few moments and you can put your computer your receptive equipment on hold for a few minutes and try and do the quiz and then we will commence further the lecture and give you the correct sequence. All right. Number one is the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage. I read in Daniel 7 a description of uh, this event. Verse 9 and on. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. That is the King James reading. The RSV says, I beheld till the thrones were placed. That is, placed in position, ready for some great event. And the Ancient of Days did sit. The Ancient of Days is the name of God the Father. And then it describes him. His hair was like the pure wool. His garment was like white as snow. And his throne was like a fiery flame. And his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. These are the angelic beings in heaven. This is a heavenly scene. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And it says here, the judgment was set and the books were opened. Right after the opening of this particular judgment scene, the horn power is seen speaking great words. In the previous lecture, I pointed out that some people are trying to say that this is a judgment that began in AD 31 when Jesus ascended on high. But there was no papal power around in AD 31. It came several Time, several years later, as we mentioned. But here is a heavenly scene, and a judgment is beginning. But before the judgment begins, we read that one like the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given unto him dominion and glory in the kingdom, and all nations, peoples, and tongues and languages should serve him, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom which shall not be destroyed. So the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage is number one in our list. Everything is made ready for this judgment scene. Thrones are placed in position. The angels assemble. But before proceedings begin, Jesus arrives. How thankful we should be that this is so because one like the Son of Man is to represent us in this judgment. In 1 Timothy 1.5 I read, There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Ellen White in Great Controversy, page 426, says, In the summer and autumn of 1844, 
the proclamation, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, was given. The coming of Christ as our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8.14, the coming of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days as presented in Daniel 7.13, which I have just read, <clears throat> and the coming of the Lord to his temple, foretold by Malachi, are descriptions of the same event. And this is represented by the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage, described by Christ in the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew chapter 25. The coming of the bridegroom here brought to view takes place before the marriage. Again, reading from Great Controversy 427, the proclamation, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, in the summer of 1844, led thousands to expect the immediate return of Jesus. So that is point number one in our list. Now we come to point number two, and that is the investigative or the pre-advent judgment. In Daniel 7, 10, it says, the judgment was set and the books were opened. Dr. Murdoch once in a seminary lecture that I was present and wondered, I was a student in those days, uh, said that there are some who say that there is no investigative or pre-advent judgment in the book of Daniel. Dr. Murdoch's comment was, quote, we would dissociate ourselves from those who make such a statement. That's his emphatic statement that uh, Dr. Murdoch made. He was the dean of the seminary back in the middle 1950s. Note that this judgment is a pre-Advent judgment. Note also that it did not commence, as some have said in AD 31, when Jesus ascended to heaven. <clears throat> Proof of this point is found in 7.11, which read that I beheld then, because of the voice of the great horns, words of the great, which the great horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and the body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. Seventh-day Adventists believe that this investigative or pre-Advent judgment began in 1844. As I said before, there was no papacy around in AD 31, but there was in 1844. And many claims made at that time, as we saw in a previous lecture, illustrate the truthfulness of the Bible prediction that great words were spoken just after the commencement of the judgment. <clears throat> Further evidence that the judgment mentioned in Daniel 7, 10 is held before the second coming is found in Revelation 14, 6 to 7, where it says that there will be a worldwide message going to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people on the face of the earth, calling on everyone to worship God and warning them about the beast and his image, and that that warning would be pointless without proclaiming it if it took place at some other time other than before the second coming. More evidence is found in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 where it states that when Jesus comes, he brings his reward with him. If he brings his reward, it must be decided before he leaves heaven who is going to receive it. In Matthew 22, 11 to 14, we read that the king comes in to examine the guests before the wedding and finds there a man without a wedding garment. And he was then thrown out. Believe that during these ancient times, the king who invited guests to come to a wedding would provide them with a wedding garment. But this man decided to come in in his own attire and did not honor the king and wear the garment that was provided. Ellen White, in Great Controversy 428, speaking of this parable of Matthew 22, says, The same figure of the marriage here is introduced, and the investigative judgment is clearly represented as taking place before the marriage. 
Previous to the wedding, the king comes in to see the guests, to see if all are attired in the wedding garment, the spotless robe of character, washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. In previous lecture, I've talked about the plan of salvation and the doctrine of righteousness by faith, and that is illustrated here in this parable story that Jesus told. Because the robe that we wear is the robe of Christ's righteousness, and that is the robe that gets us or qualifies us to go into God's presence in this marriage feast. Now we come to point number three. That is the close of probation, which marks the end of the pre-advent or investigative judgment. Many Bible verses speak of the day when it will be too late to be saved. Genesis 6 verse 3, the time of Noah's flood, God said, My spirit will not always strive with man. God's spirit is sent forth to convict men and women of their sins. But if they resist and refuse to listen to the pleadings of the spirit, Eventually, the Spirit will leave them, and that is why Jesus said the sin against the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin. It's unpardonable because they never confess it. And if they never confess it, they never receive forgiveness, so the sin remains unforgiven. Genesis 7, 1 to 10 said that probation closed a short time before the actual flood began. And so... It is true with the close of human probation at the end of time. It will be a short while before the second coming. Amos 8, 11 to 12 says that there is coming a famine for the word of God. Many will seek for it and will not find it because it is too late. That is a picture of some men and women who will want to find forgiveness and find salvation after probation is closed, but it is too late. Zephaniah 2, 1 to 3 says, before the decree brings forth, that is the time when we should accept the provision that God has made. In the parable of the ten virgins, the five foolish ones came after the door was shut and said, Lord, Lord, open to us. Matthew 22, 10 to 13 Lord, Lord, open to us. And what does Jesus reply? I know you not. How sad those words are. Probation has closed. <clears throat> and in Matthew 22, verses 11 to 12, we read the words that Jesus will utter when he closes human probation. It says that he will announce... He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. See, when Jesus closes human probation, nobody will be changing sides. No wicked person can find salvation, and no sealed and redeemed person will be lost. All cases have been decided for eternity. In Great Controversy 428, I read, When the work of investigation shall be ended, when the cases of all who in all ages have professed to be followers of Christ have been examined and decided, then and not till then, the probation will close and the door of mercy will be shut. Thus, in one short sentence, Quote, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut, end quote. We are carried down through the Saviour's final ministration to the time when the great work for man's salvation will be completed. Now we come to point number four. That is the marriage of the bridegroom. What does the symbol of the marriage represent? To whom is the bridegroom married? In Scripture, the marriage metaphor is used in two different ways. In both metaphors, Jesus is the bridegroom.
But in the two metaphors, the bride is not the same. Listen carefully. In Revelation 19, 7 to 12, I read, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. In this parable, in this illustration, in this metaphor, the bride is clearly the church. Those that have been redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. To read more along this slide, you can see the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 985 and 986. But there is in Scripture another metaphor in which the bride is said to be the new Jerusalem. Let's have a look at Scripture that deals with this aspect, this metaphor. It's found in Revelation chapter 21, verses 2 and verses 9 to 10. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. An angel spoke to John, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. In this metaphor, Jesus is said to be married to the new Jerusalem, which is to be the capital of his kingdom. Since his ascension to heaven, Jesus has been working as our high priest. When this work is finished, at the close of probation, he will take off his priestly robes and put on his kingly gowns and receive his kingdom. When he comes in the second advent, he comes as King of kings and Lord of lords to gather together the citizens of his kingdom. This act in receiving his kingdom is called in these verses the marriage of the Lamb. In Daniel 7, 14, it says, And there was given to him, to Jesus, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. This marriage takes place right after the close of probation, while Jesus is still in heaven. Now I read from Luke chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. We are to be like men, it says, that wait for their Lord when he shall return from the wedding, and that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. And in Matthew 25, 10, <clears throat> God's people are spoken of as going into the marriage before the close of probation. They went in with him and the door was shut. Now the only way that that can take place for us to go in to be with him in the marriage is by faith. Because this marriage takes place in heaven. Jesus receives his kingdom in heaven before the second coming. But by faith, we who believe in him and who know what is going on in the heavenly sanctuary because of what the Bible teaches us, by faith can enter into the marriage. We are to understand what is going on in heaven now and what will happen when the judgment work is ended and probation closes. We are to understand then that Jesus will receive his kingdom and become king of kings and lord of lords. Let me read Great Controversy further, page 426. The marriage represents the reception by Christ of his kingdom. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, which is the capital and representative of his kingdom, is called the bride, the bride of the lamb, the lamb's wife. And page 427, they, the saints, were not to be present in person at the marriage, for it takes place in heaven, as we have seen. 
while we are upon the earth. The followers of Christ are to wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. But they are to understand his work and to follow him by faith as he goes in before God. It is in this sense, she says, that they are said to go in to the marriage. And early writings, page 251, she wrote, I saw that while Jesus was in the most holy place, he would be married to the new Jerusalem. And after his work should be accomplished in the holiest, he would descend to the earth in kingly power and take to himself his precious ones who had patiently awaited his return. And page 280, early writings, every case has been decided for life or death. While Jesus had been ministering in the sanctuary, the judgment had been going on for the righteous dead and then for the righteous living. Christ had received his kingdom, having made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. And we talked about that in the previous lecture. The subjects of the kingdom were made up. The marriage of the lamb was consummated and the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven was given to Jesus and the heirs of salvation. And Jesus was to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And early writing, page 281. Then I saw Jesus lay off his priestly attire and clothe himself with his most kingly robes. Upon his head were many crowns, a crown within a crown, surrounded by the heavenly host, he left heaven. Now, I'm sure you don't have to guess what the next event is when Jesus leaves heaven. That is the second coming, number five. First Thessalonians 4.16 describes it. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. In Revelation 19, 11 to 21, which you can read in detail, gives to us a description of Jesus coming as an all-conquering king. In this illustration, riding, as it were, on a white horse, he is pictured as having a sharp sword coming out of his mouth with which he will smite the nations that have rejected him. He is clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, representing his death upon the cross of Calvary, by which we are redeemed. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh, it says, a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Having received his kingdom, great controversy, 427, having received his kingdom, he will come in his glory as King of kings and Lord of lords for the redemption of his people who are to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob at his table in his kingdom to partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that quote introduces number six, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19.9 says, Blessed are they who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. <clears throat> Matthew 26.29, But I say unto you, Jesus talking to his disciples when he instituted the Lord's Supper, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Luke 22.30 says that we may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, Jesus says. Then Jesus says that he himself will serve us, Luke 12.37. And Great Controversy 4.27, Ellen White describes this, having received his kingdom, he will come in his glory as King of kings and Lord of lords for the redemption of his people who are to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at his table in his kingdom to partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And early writings, 1920. After we beheld the glory of the temple, we went out, and Jesus left us and went to the city. Soon we heard his lovely voice again saying, Come, my people, you have come out of great tribulation and done my will, suffered for me, Come in to supper, for I will gird myself and serve you. We shouted, Alleluia, glory, and entered into the city. I saw a table of pure silver, 
It was many miles in length, yet our eyes could extend over it. Apparently our eyesight is going to be much better in heaven than what it is here on this earth. Then we come to point number seven. The righteous judging the wicked. During the millennium, which we spend in heaven with Jesus, the righteous are given a work of judging the wicked. We read about this in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they, the righteous, redeemed ones, sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul is talking to the believers in the Corinthian church who were having trouble taking one another to court outside with non-believers. But uh, he said, you should not do that. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Know you not that ye shall judge angels? Now, we're not going to judge the righteous angels. The obvious conclusion is that Jesus here is talking about the fallen angels that we will judge. And Daniel 7.22 says, Judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints should possess the kingdom. This last verse has two possible interpretations, both of which are theologically correct. The word that leaves the interpretation open is the word to. Judgment is given to the saints. What is this little word? It is the word li, L-I. It has two meanings. It means to, that is, judgment was given to the saints for them to do the work of judging, which we will do during the millennium. But the other meaning is judgment is given in favour of the saints, and that takes place during the pre-advent judgment when the saints there are judged worthy of eternal life. Both, of course, are theologically correct. It is this judgment in Daniel 7 that takes place three phases of judgment, namely the pre-advent judgment, the judgment of the horned power, and the judgment in heaven during the millennium, when the redeemed saints share in the work of judging the wicked. In Great Controversy, it is interesting to note that Ellen White uses this verse and applies it to the work of the righteous in heaven during the millennium in judging the wicked. She wrote, quote, During the thousand years between the first and the second resurrection, the judgment of the wicked takes place. See, the wicked are not really judged in the pre-advent judgment. The names that come up in the pre-advent judgment are those who have entered into the service of God, those who have accepted Jesus as their saviour and have their names written in the book of life. It's to see that they retain their names in the book of life. The judgment of the wicked is a separate work. During the thousand years between the first and second resurrection, she wrote, the judgment of the wicked takes place. The apostle points, Paul the Apostle Paul points to this judgment as an event that follows the second advent. He wrote, Judge nothing for the time until the Lord come, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Daniel declares that when the Ancient of Days came, judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. In union with Christ, the saints joined in the judgment work of the wicked, comparing their acts with God's statute book, the Bible. You see, in handling the sin problem, God is doing everything so carefully that sin will never come back into his universe again. If someone we know and thought would be in heaven is not there, we will have ample opportunity to know the reason why he or she is excluded during the millennium. God will not cover anything over in a way that would leave doubts in the minds of everyone, for such doubts could give rise to the coming in of sin again and cause rebellion once more in the universe, and God will not allow that to take place. I sometimes illustrate it to folk you, in my lectures, so you get to heaven and you find I'm not there. Now, I'm sure you aren't planning to be there. 
But if I'm not there, you go to the Lord and you say, where is Pastor Tolhurst? And the Lord says to you, mind your own business. I know what I'm doing. On your way. You might leave, but there could then be a doubt in your mind. What is he covering? The Lord won't do that to you. He won't send you away. He will say, come and look at the records. And there you'll see the record of my life where I committed some transgression. Maybe I cheated on my income tax returns or told something that was not true or committed some other sin and did not repent. And then you'll say, Lord, I now know why you have excluded him. We will have opportunity to settle any doubt that we have about the goodness of God because God will not allow sin to come back again. And in order to make sure it does not, everyone, the angels who are watching the judgment now, and those of us who can't watch it now because we're here, we're given a chance to review what God has judged during the millennium, a thousand years to check up on God. Make sure that we are all satisfied God is honest and fair and just and has made no mistakes. In that way, we will bring vindication to God as we talked about in the previous lecture. So God is handling the sin problem in a very careful way. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and that every tongue should confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Even the wicked, before they are destroyed, we are told, will acknowledge that God is just and fair, that he is the Lord of all. Even Satan will bow down and acknowledge that God's justice is fair. He probably doesn't think he's going to do it now, but prophecy says that he will. I read from Great Controversy, page 670-671. And now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. There it is. God's wisdom, his justice, and his goodness stand fully vindicated. It is seen that all his dealings in the great controversy have been conducted with respect to the good, the eternal good of his people and the good of all the worlds that he has created. For all the facts of the great controversy in view, the whole universe both loyal and rebellious, with one accord declare, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now we come to the number eight, the final one of the eight events that we were discussing. And that is the final coronation of the bridegroom. In a sense, Jesus will be crowned when he takes up his kingdom right after the close of probation, but there is to be a final coronation service that will take place just before the wicked are destroyed. Ellen White calls this crowning the final coronation. Revelation 19:12, on his head were many crowns. Chapter 20, verse 5 tells us that at the end of the millennium, the wicked dead are raised to life. 21, verse 2 and 10, the holy city descends to earth. Revelation 20, verse 9, the wicked encompass the camp of the saints about. Satan now is loose from his prison house, chain that is circumstances that is bound him with no one to tempt for a thousand years. And he goes out to deceive the nations once more, as we read in Revelation chapter 20. And then we read about the final judgment scene that takes place. Ellen White describes it in these words. Great Controversy, page 666. As soon as the books of record are opened and the eye of Jesus rests upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. In the presence of the assembled inhabitants of the earth and heaven, the final coronation of the Son of God takes place and now invested with supreme authority and power, the King of Kings pronounces sentence upon the rebels against his government and executes justice upon those who have transgressed his law and oppressed his people. After the destruction of the wicked, God recreates the earth to be the home of the redeemed. For I read in Revelation 21, verses 1 to 8, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, 
I make all things new. The great controversy has ended. The final paragraph again of great controversy, one of my favorite quotes. The great controversy has ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom <coughs> to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshattered beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. My prayer for you all is that we will all be there to share in this wonderful new world. May God bless you. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.